you're bringing a different perspective when it comes to all these feelings most people have a negative label on and you're kind of changing it into a positive. So I'd love to just start from the inspiration. You're putting together this book. What's been going on that you've noticed that you're like, we need to talk about this? Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I think it was Adam Grant that, that used a term called vuja day, which is where there's a fresh perspective on an old way of thinking. And I have been in the motivation business for 31 years since I was literally 15 years old, first as a young basketball coach and now as a business coach to some of the you know top people in the world. And, and motivation has been talked about a lot of ways. There's about 20 different motivational theories. Uh, and so I think this is a fresh way to look at motivation, which is not motivation or inspiration, but more activation. How do you activate a deep drive inside of you to pursue ultimately your potential? Now, it could be sales or opportunity or deals or partnerships. But at the end of the day, it's really trying to activate a drive inside of you to pursue your deepest human potential. That's really what prey drive is. I found it very interesting in terms of the, the term itself, like activating the prey drive. And I almost had to do a double take on it because I feel like if you're looking at like motivational talks and you're, you're looking at activating something, I hear a lot of talks around predator or be the warrior. And here we're talking about activating the prey drive. So unpack that for us. And what made you, you know, sure. really focus on this aspect? Yeah, prey drive, P-R-E-Y, D-R-I-V-E, is prevalent in animals. Uh, an animal has a prey drive, which is, it's the animal's ability to stalk, capture, and kill prey. And uh, so what, I'm, what I've done there is associated that term in humans, I actually trademarked it in humans. And what I'm saying is, as a coach, mostly a motivational coach my whole life, I believe a human has a drive inside of them that is instinctual to pursue I have young children. They pursue things, right? When they're interested, they are relentless in pursuing those things. But life kind of has a way of knocking that pursuit out of you. So what I've done in this is I've given it a new definition. In humans, it's the human's instinct to see something with the eyes optically or in the mind, which would be the imagination, and to have the persistence and the intensity to pursue that which you see in the mind. So a dream you see in the mind. All things are created twice first mentally, then physically. And so what I'm saying is prey drive in a human is your ability to see something that you want and you pursue that with persistence and intensity. And then I've broken down different drivers or what, what I believe as a, as a performance coach actually activates that wantingness inside of you to actually want a better life, to want to pursue something. And that's really uh, in humans how I've associated it with animals. Hmm. I love that. And I've also noticed that, you know, when you're in this space where you're starting to, you know, set goals, visions, I mean, we're fresh on the start of the year as well. You often are able to kind of give yourself a definition or, or, or goal saying like, okay, I think I want this. And, you know, I deliberately use this term. I think I want that. Or maybe it'd be nice to have this. And there seems to be obstacles. There seems to be things that distract us, that get us off guard. I know for me, a lot of people want to be, you know, growing the business, successfully being entrepreneurs, growing their sales. And it's feels fairly easy to say, yeah, I want to set that target. But to get ourselves motivated, to get ourselves um, kind of on that journey, I love that you use a specific term, activating a state to pursue it. It seems like there's something missing. Yeah, it's important to understand that that, we don't necessarily wake up in the mornings with this drive activated. It actually has to be activated. Uh, just because I'm in the motiva motivation business, just because I've written 17 books, does not mean that I wake up motivated every day. It doesn't mean that I feel like coaching people after 31 years. It doesn't feel like I feel like but prospecting or I feel like following up on leads or creating a sale. So what I'm trying to do is really associate that there's a time to flip the switch like the athlete that's playing in a big game, like an artist that's performing on a big stage. You know, if you've been an artist for 30 years singing the same songs, you don't necessarily always feel like singing those songs, but that's what people pay the big money to see. And so there's in the book, I talk about routines I have and how I actually activate my drive daily to kind of go into the sales battle, to go into, you know, to go in and create and go into pursue and go into follow up. Because pre drive, think of it this way in sales, it's really pursuing something, pursuing a lead, pursuing an opportunity, pursuing someone who is interested in doing business with you. 
And what our natural state is, Jason, is actually to to be in a stationary position, right? Most people sit. Inertia is resistance to move. So what most people do is they go, especially in an economy like we have in the United States right now, and they freeze. They don't know what to do. They don't do anything, right? And so it, when, in the book, I kind of go into the psychology of activating the drive, which has a lot to do with the subconscious mind programming the subconscious mind to move toward a tangible target, you know, a sales target, a daily target, a number of high value activities that you're doing to produce a sale or create a sale. So I go into to, to the importance of writing it down, mapping it out, how that uh, programs a subconscious mind, a supercomputer to move toward a tangible target or what I call in the book a B. So you're at A right now and you're moving toward B. B is some ideal number. I have a daily sales number in my coaching company that I try to hit. And that gives us a target to move toward. And it tells the brain we're going into action today versus uh, sitting in inertia. It feels counterintuitive. If you if you are trying to be your best and your body's kind of trying to protect yourself, help you thrive as an individual, you, you, it would feel like the natural state would make us pursue these goals that kind of allow us to have more survivability, you could say. Yeah. But yet this inertia still is prevalent. Like what what's going on? Why are we being self-destructive in that capacity? Well, the brain is interesting. It's it's uh, it's lazy. It's thousands of years old. It hasn't evolved much. It's in a survival mindset. It wakes up in the morning. It takes the path of least resistance. It you know it doesn't it doesn't know how to thrive. It knows how to survive. Okay, so to thrive, you have to tell the brain what to do. It's why I'd say your brain works for you. You don't work for it. And so I tell people, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a greatness factory and I'm going to have success school for kids and I'm going to do this. And it's crazy when I do this exercise because the whole book is really this big exercise of moving from where you are to where you're trying to go and then keeping the prey drive activated over and over and over and over. Like, for example, we're here at the end of the year, you know, or when people are listening to this in the beginning of the year and people are tired, they fatigue. They are we're just exhausted. They've pushed, especially if they're running a small business, which can be absolutely brutal to get up every day and try to go produce sales and create sales. So what happens is the prey drive is suppressed many times by a couple of things. Uh, feelings, right? And that's why I say amateurs listen to their feelings. Professionals don't always listen to their feelings. Uh, the prey drive is suppressed by satisfied needs. So when we are making, I have a good life, we're making a good amount of money. Uh, you know, yesterday I was on the phone with a woman who said, I just don't, I just don't feel like I need to activate my prey drive cause I'm comfortable. And I just said to her, if we fast forward to 84 years old, if we use Jeff Bezos, uh, regret minimization framework at 84, when you look back over your life, do you want to say you were comfortable or, or do you want to say you pursued your potential? You became what you were capable of becoming. And that question kind of activated her prey drive. says, you know, I do have potential. I do want to do something. But here's what's interesting, Jason. Um, a lot of people, it's dormant. It's laden. It's undeveloped. My own wife came to one of my workshops at 30 years old. She was selling cell phones for uh, Verizon. And her manager said, you know, you have some natural potential. You should go see this coach. And I didn't know her at the time. And, and she came and sat in the back of my workshop and that one workshop activated her prey drive. She left the job she was in because that wasn't what she was supposed to be doing. She got serious about her potential she, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And she's a totally different person today, you know, 10 years later than she was when she walked into that workshop. So that's why I say in the book, exposure activates prey drive. See, she had never been in a self-help seminar. She had never read a self-help book. And so that one evening activated her drive to want to be better and activate that potential. Yeah, I, I, I can see that a lot of times I've seen it be dormant and I can see what happens when you start activating it, which brings me to the question that if you are going into something of a prey drive, it seems like a high resource activity. Like it seems like you're activating your mind, your resources, yeah. your, your alpha, the hunt, you have like tunnel vision. It, it feels like a, a flow state, right? I, I don't know if that's a, a synonym in the in this case, but yeah. I'm wondering if you're going into prey drive, is this something that comes with a refractionary period? Like you need to recover from prey drive or is it something you can turn on, tap into yeah. and consistently maintain? 
Yeah, that's that's interesting that you asked that because nobody's asked me that question uh, in all the interviews that I've done. So it's a great question. Many years ago, I wrote a book called Zebras and Cheetahs. I don't know what my fascination is with animals and humans. And it was really my first major published book. And uh, I studied cheetahs. And cheetahs had this incredible prey drive to attack but but in the process of attacking, they would literally work themselves up into such a frenzy that if they didn't kill their prey in a certain period of time, they could actually kill their own self uh, because of the intensity. All right, and they would so they would attack, and then when they would go sit, that's why you see a cheetah go sit under a tree or go sit and relax, and it right. And so, what what I really think about when I think about prey drive is when you peek up, think of an artist. The artist makes the most money when they perform. They typically only perform for short windows of time in comparison to how most people work, an hour, two hours. And in that hour or two hours, that artist could make a million dollars or two million dollars. But it takes an enormous amount of focus and energy to peak up like that. And they just can't go with that pace seven days a week, 365 days a year, which is why you see artists tour three or four days a week and then they rest. So they rest, they practice they perform. They rest, they practice, and they perform. And I, that's how I think of prey drive, is, is there needs to be rejuvenation cycles, like the cheetah sitting under the tree resting before you go back into battle, uh, so that you can peak up. And when you don't, uh, the symptom of that or, or the outcome of that would be burnout, which would be loss of all joy or passion for something just because you've done it so much and so hard. And that actually happened to me as a basketball coach. I worked 80 hours a week for a decade, as a head basketball coach, I built a national championship team. I literally didn't have a life. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have I didn't have anything but winning. And uh, and at the end of that tenure cycle, I was exhausted. I didn't want to think about it, talk about it. I did. I, I retired at 31 years old. I mean, from that pro- from from athletic uh, profession. So that's how sick of it I was after going that hard without any rejuvenation cycles. By the way, yeah. Yeah, and you know, there's there's a part of me that's like, oh my God, have I opened a Pandora's box that shouldn't be open yet by asking that question? Because I've I'm afraid that somebody might hear this response and be afraid of getting into prey drive by just yep. hearing like, oh, if you take it too far, it could be bad. Yep. While most of the people don't even start it, you know what I yep. mean? So it's like this is a problem for your future self because I find like the potential of being able to activate the prey drive and to bring the resources on your side to maybe go on this deep journey to maybe go on this like extended trip because in your case like I you you went really really uh, you know intensely for ten years but it's also been a foundation for you doing what you do now and being aware of how the prey drive works and that it needs this refractionary. So I just wanted to say that as a caveat that if you're listening to this know that you shouldn't be thinking of hesitating about using the prey drive. You should go and discover it, use it. And once you need to know what your limits are, you're only going to find out once you've actually been in that space, which, you know, brings me to one of the other aspects I want to kind of dig into. You said uh, the feelings, professionals, they don't focus on the feelings as much, where there seems to be a whole movement that's uh, telling us to be more in touch with our feelings, to trust our intuition, uh, yeah. to, to follow our passions. And these all seem to be more in a, well, I don't know if I'll use the technical term, more of on the fluffy side of, you know, setting goals. But in your case, you're saying if you want to be a pro, that needs to be put on a second, you know, on a second priority list. Yeah, I think there's a difference between between listening to your intuition, which would be the instinct to pursue, and listening to your feelings when when there's things that clearly need to be done to grow grow a business that you just don't want to do. I mean, even today, you know, I have a multi-million dollar coaching company. I still have to prospect every day. I still have to follow up with people every day. I still have to do things that I don't really feel like doing. Like in an ideal world, I would just wake up and coach. Uh, and, and I'm moving toward this. Promote, create, promote, deliver is really all, all I want to do at this point in my career. But for me to back out of the sales, you know, part of the reason we've done multi-million dollars is because I'm a good salesperson. I'm convicted. I have a lot of passion. I know how to get another person enthusiastic. So, uh, I don't necessarily enjoy that part. I think even some of your top salespeople would tell you they don't necessarily enjoy that part. But it is a a necessary evil to running a business. The business needs the revenue to grow. So what I'm really saying there is, although I don't feel like prospecting, I do it every day because I'm a pro. I don't feel like following up, but I follow up like a pro. And 
Uh, I don't always feel like coaching people, you know, but people are expecting when they pay money to come see me that I'm going to give them a great effort. They don't, they don't care if it's a bad day or an off day or what they paid for is to come see the guy they see on the videos and on YouTube and it on big stages and, and the guy who wrote the book. And so, you know, there's a tremendous amount of pressure that comes along with that. That's a positive pressure. But at the same time, uh, you just can't get caught up in your feelings because if not, you probably wouldn't do a lot of things it takes to run a successful small business. Hmm. You know, I find it funny, even myself, I almost try to override some of my, call it lazy tendencies, by making the sales, committing to to having these kind of coaching calls or, or these appointments in my calendar because I know I need to show up for these. That's like, that's the things that become non-negotiable. So I can't wiggle out of it once it's a client because once they're my client, they're in my care, They've there's been an exchange of value. I need to show up for that. Right. And I'm wondering if this is one of the ways you use some of those primary drivers you, you speak about and flip the switch because you're talking about these things around like exposure, fear, environment, and kind of stacking these different call them negative, maybe usually used context uh, drivers, but using those as the fuel to make you pursue this prey drive. I, am I understanding it correctly? Yeah, I think, see, what I'm trying to do is I'm a practitioner. I have been coaching people literally for 31 years. So I have a lot of qualitative and quantitative data. And, and so when you see big concepts like find your why, you know, if you just found your why, Jason, it would, you would be motivated and the world would change. And, and I, I think it's a great concept. I think Simon Sinek's a genius. I think he's he's sold a lot more books than I have. But I've probably been in the trenches coaching more people. And and that's thousands and thousands of people over 31 years. And so what I would tell you is that I could know my why. You know, chapter three of the new book is called Screw Your Why. And it's, it's uh, here's my belief. It is that I do not believe you have to find your why to do something big in the world, number one. Uh Number two, I think I could actually know my purpose and still not be motivated today to do it. So I think by discovering your purpose, it doesn't automatically activate your prey drive. It's like, I can know I'm supposed to coach people. I can know this is what I was put on planet Earth to do, but man, I don't feel like doing it today. And so what I like better, and I talk about this extensively in the book, are what's called because goals. And a because goal is a big reason you do something when you don't feel like it. Here's some examples. Because I grew up poor, I made up my mind I was never going to be poor again. Because I didn't have that great relationship with my father, I made up my mind I was going to have a great relationship with my kids. Because a coach poured into me when I was young, I made up my mind I was going to be a coach to people for the rest of my life. See, these are big reasons, right? Let's take that one with my kids, for example. If I go coach people all day long and I'm tired and I'm exhausted and I'm on vitamins and I'm on great regimens and I'm on great diets and I'm on, you know, I've got all this energy, but when I come home, I'm tired. I I can know, man, I'm supposed to be a good parent, but that because goal kicks in, man, because I didn't have those that time with my dad, maybe that overrides my feelings. It's like, man, I'm going to make sure I spend this time with my kids because of that reason. So I like because goals better than finding your why. And I like these activators because let's say I wake up tomorrow and I've got four or five of these a podcast because we're promoting this book. We believe the book has a real chance of being a Wall Street Journal bestseller. We're getting tremendous traction in the pre-sales. Um, and I don't feel like doing the podcast, okay? Because I committed to making this book a, a hit, because I believe this book will change people's lives. What I can do is start thinking about these activators, okay? So fear would be, oh my gosh, what if I don't push hard enough? What if I don't hit the Wall Street Journal, it's like I said I was going to. And that's a personal goal of mine. And, and not for the reason of the notoriety, but more to tell my kids, to show my kids that, man, you can go from here to here in life, or you can grow up in a small town and do big things. Okay, that's a because goal. So, or, or competition. Man, I don't like getting beat by other people. And I, I have friendly competitions with all of the major players out there when they have their books coming out. Or what if uh, exposure or embarrassment? What if it's just embarrassing, man, that I just don't perform when people think I'm a performance coach? So what, I, what I've learned how to do is tap into those things. Some of those things could be conceived as negative. Even my agent and my, excuse me, my publisher asked me, is prey drive activated by negative things? Sometimes. Sometimes a slight. Sometimes being really embarrassed by something. Sometimes someone making fun of you. Sometimes someone rejecting you. These are tremendous raw materials to activate your prey drive. 
to do something bigger. Okay. And I, as a coach, really don't care what, what it was if something activated your drive. You know, I'm going to see this great coach, coach tomorrow night. And uh, he's in the Hall of Fame. And I started asking questions about what really made him a Hall of Fame coach. And uh, he said, you know, when I was in high school, I was really small. I wasn't very good at basketball. And all of the other kids made fun of me. And I made up my mind that I was going to become great at something. I was going to become this great coach. That is his primary activator of his prey drive, rejection. And he's become this incredible Hall of Fame coach because in high school, the other kids made fun of him. So this is kind of what the book gets into is knowing you, knowing what activates you, going deeper, not just being motivated or pop-up psychology or cotton candy motivation. But I mean, when you really need to call up on this prey drive, you can call upon it and, and bring it in to you. Yeah, I, I think that's so relevant. And it makes me think of two things. One is uh, with your latest example about basketball, um, I believe it was, I don't know what year this was, but didn't Michael Jordan do some sort of speech where he's just like, I was, you know, this is for everyone who didn't believe in me. And he had this like almost yeah. anger. And yeah. it was very surprising for a lot of people that that was one of his key yeah. prey drive activators yeah. to make him one of the greatest of all time. And so I thought that was fascinating. The second one is, I think back of um, my own journey. And, you know, when I was, uh, one of the first businesses I did, I was uh, flipping real estate in America. And I went through a program where I realized everything I was taught was wrong. Uh, and they just told me the things I needed to hear to put me in a room to record a testimonial. And they started running these infomercials across Canada. Yeah. And I was so embarrassed. I was mad. I was betrayed. And I'm grateful now because of that experience It's by no coincidence that I'm here trying to teach ethical businesses, the power and beauty of sales to sell with love. Cause I don't want anyone else to go through this kind of experience and God, was it ever embarrassing for me? And it's almost like that's my prey drive activator. And I wouldn't have written my book. I wouldn't be hosting this podcast if it didn't keep me going, knowing that if I can get some more amazing people to be exposed, great people to like learn how sales is a beautiful thing. Yeah. This is my activator. And I can see how it's, it seems to usually be like if you're going top performer, it's almost like a trauma to make you behave in ways that are so unrealistic that you pursue extremely great thing. Like, is it like yeah. that? Like the higher performance you go, the more yeah. there seems to be this site trauma that fuels it relentlessly. Yep. Yeah, I think in 2018, I had a lot of conflict, business conflict, some some bad business partners. And it, it, it really was hard to deal with. So I started studying conflict. How do you handle conflict? Uh, I was a disciple of Covey, so he was big into third alternative thinking. And, you know, so I went all these places and studied conflict. And the, the big revelation I had during that period, which is incredibly valuable, was that conflict is actually necessary for expansion. And real passion does not come from emotion. Real passion comes from conflict when you've really been screwed over when you've really been done wrong when some there's a real injustice that 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 creates a prey drive in you to right or wrong to do like like what you've taken you know you had that experience you took that experience you were using it as a raw material to help people and show people that there's a better way to sell see that was an activator of your prey drive and it and so you know you use the word trauma or conflict or some type of um, revelation that you have, some type of major experience. But it was from that experience I had that, that I said, you know what, when you have negative things happen to you in life, that it can be a tremendous source or activator of that prey drive. If you watch the last dance about the Chicago Bulls and watch that documentary about Michael Jordan, to play at that level that many times for that many years, you almost have to create a drama, create a problem to activate. And if you watch that documentary, he, he used anything he could to activate his drive. After a game one night, he was shaking hands and the person said to him, good game. And that just infuriated him. You know, you don't tell the greatest player of all time, good game. You know, to him, that was a slap in the face. Uh, and, and the next night he scores 60, 63 points. Uh, he was eating dinner at a restaurant one night and the, the coach of the opposing team was at the same restaurant, but he didn't acknowledge Michael Jordan. 
as if he didn't e- wasn't even in the restaurant. He saw him and he didn't speak to him or acknowledge him. And that infuriated him. And that activated his prey drive. So the next night he scores, you know, 50 something points. And he's like, you know, I'll show you who the best player is. That's really a good example of of activating and reactivating that drive and using something, even if you had to make something up, even if you had to create an imaginary nemesis in your mind, sometimes you need that, especially if you've been doing something for a long cycle of time. And I think, you know, for someone who might not have even gone off the ground, I think this is something you should at least be doing for a while to get yourself to a better position, whether you're transitioning from career into entrepreneurship, you're trying to scale the business, cross the million dollar mark, like build that fire like put some wood in there and make sure that it gets you to a place where, you know, again, don't focus on the problem at the top 0.01% and thinking that should be a reason for you to not even consider these tools. Go into the fire, put in the logs and see where it takes you. I think it puts you on a beautiful journey. And I think we'll solve a lot of the petty uh, issues that we face at the beginning of the journey to make you deal with what I would call much higher quality problems once you're on the path of success. I... I love this whole conversation. I want to make sure for everybody tuning in, uh, we're definitely going to have a link in the show notes to flip the switch, uh, activate the drive to achieve a freakish level of success. I think for anybody who's just getting started or on the journey already, this is just a way to turn it up a notch, which is definitely something that's required for us to stay ultra competitive and do our best in the world today. I I want to ask this question because I, I, I picked up on this and I'd love to know your opinion. A lot of times I see some people that might be coaches Um, you might be a coach out there and you realize that sales is something you're uncomfortable with, but coaching is something you love. And I'm wondering in your case, like, do you see a significant difference between having a sales conversation versus having a coaching conversation? I think a sales conversation is a coaching conversation. I think, I think when I'm selling, I am really locating the ambition of another person or I'm locating the problem. And so I'm a, I, the way I sell is very consultive. You know, I'm an expert. I've been doing this 31 years. I've shown a demonstrated capacity. I've generated millions of dollars. So when, when I'm talking to a person, I'm listening and locating what they're trying to do. And the easiest way to find out what they're trying to do is to ask them that question. And I, and I typically say it like this. Man, for me to really help you uh, move from A to B in your life, I, I really de- I have to ask you an important question. What are you trying to do? And people many times will tell me, I'm trying to build my team. I'm trying to get my small business going. I'm trying to make a million dollars. I'm trying to do this. And then I, after I listen, I then, you know, kind of prescribe, this is the path I would take with you. No different than a doctor that's a consultative seller. And I say, man, this is what I would do to help you move from A, where you currently are, to B. That's why locating their ambition is so important. Sales, at the end of the day, is just exchange of money for value. That's really monetization, and it's I have a problem, and you have a solution to that problem. I have an ambition, and you have a, a skill set to help me with that ambition. So I think when you look at sales that way, then it's not this negative thing. It's really I can't help a person until they commit to something, and a contract is just a covenant between two people, and they really need each other, to be honest, to to move from A to B. So if you take that approach, it's not something that's negative or uh, it's like, I'm here to help you. I have a demonstrated capacity in doing this. I mean, I remember uh, one of my coaches gave me a free coaching session. His sales cycle was this. I did a habit finder test. He came back and showed me the results of that, which which showed my deepest habits of thinking, okay, which was valuable. He showed me where I was potentially unhappy, which was right on the money. And then he went through how he would help me move toward my goals. And then at the very end, he said, would you like my help with this? And that was his close. There was no pressure. There was no hard. It was literally just like, here's what the results are. Does this look right to you? Yes. If I could help you move more toward your genius area and be happier, would you like my help with this? And I thought it was just the, the coolest close ever. Because it's like, yes, I would like your help. Okay, for me to help you, it's six month agreement and it's uh, an investment of this. And my assistant's going to call and, and, and handle all the details with you. But it was, it was a, you know, and I just think about that. That was a sale. He created a sale there, but not in a negative way. I actually needed his help and it was incredibly valuable for me to, for me to, for me to go through that. Lovely. Yeah. And 
you know, that that is 100% what I'm advocating for. And I do think that, you know, sales conversations are coaching conversation, which surprises me when, well, yes and no. It, it surprises me when I see someone who is a coach have sales blocks, but at the same time doesn't surprise me because when you're just getting started in coaching, it's not necessarily a sales problem. It's a competence problem. And having demonstrating of capacity, I think, ends up being the biggest block for us to confidently go out and sell. So there's there's an element where you need to take a risk on yourself and believe that you will deliver on what you promise. You will go above and beyond, even if you're just getting started, to create those demonstrations of capacity. And if you care enough and you got a prey drive by your side, I know that anybody listening to this is going to be doing some wonderful things in the world. Coach Michael Burt, Fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. There's always a powerful question I love to ask since you are on the Selling with Love podcast. And I'd love to know, what does selling with love mean to you? I think it means really getting getting out of selling and into helping people with their ambitions. It, it means to me that that is, the, that is really what you're doing is you're using your talents and your skills to help another person advance toward their ambition toward their dreams toward their desires you're or you're solving a problem for them and that is incredibly valuable okay and, and if you look at it like that to me selling with love doesn't have to be stressful it can be it can be fun it can be light it doesn't have to be so heavy it can be it doesn't have to be pressure and and you know I write about this in the book especially one of my other books is there is no such thing as rejection in in my opinion some people will want what you have. Some people will not want what you have. And that's okay. There's plenty of people. There's no shortage of people. There's no shortage of money. There's no shortage of opportunity. So, so just move on because, because you're only looking for people that are looking for you. Beautiful. Coach Michael Berg, thank you so much for your time. And everybody listening, again, go and grab a copy of Flip the Switch. It's coming out. It's probably out by the time you listen to this or if you just listen to this when it released, it will be out tomorrow. We want to help reach the goal, the Wall Street bestseller list. So go ahead, pre-order that book. It'll be delivered to you tomorrow. Or if it's already out by the time you listen to this, grab yourself a copy. Fantastic book, amazing concepts. What I want to make sure everyone leaves with is this idea that we are, all have within us a parade drive. And if we're having any struggles in our current state of mind, perhaps this is the switch we need to flip to get to the next level, to start handling bigger and bigger goals as we maximize our impact. And of course, do it always with integrity. Thank you all for listening. And once again, Coach Michael Burke, thank you for sharing. And as always, keep selling with love. Thank you.